So I'm going to go ahead and just as a fun thing to get us started, I'm going to share the poll results up here. Yes, coffee is uh, our standout winner right now with 18 of us having that. And I'm guessing more people haven't completed the poll. Me, I had coffee and eggs. Coffee and cereal, still working on the coffee. Yeah. So with that, I think I'm all um, full enough and ready to start talking about communicating the value of our work which I think is a very interesting topic. And I uh, signed up to help host this topic in part because it's something I've thought about for a number of years. Uh, it's about three, four years ago, I went to a uh, library assessment conference and I can't remember the exact name of it. It was something like library assessment planning. Um, it was very simple, so. Um, and it was very good and I saw all sorts of presentations about how to tell the story about what your reference service is doing and library instruction and tying that into in student outcomes and all this stuff. I did not see one that tried to do that with things that technical. Okay. Lost you. <laughs> oh my, so it looks like Athena's connection is temporarily dropped off. Um, we will give her just a minute. Can you all hear me though? Yes. Okay, great. Good. Um, so we'll give her a minute to pop back on. I'm sure it's just a temporary glitch <laughs> as I nervously chuckle. <laughs> um, so, uh, Athena asked me to help her with this presentation. I do know that we really want this to be a participatory session. Um, so we really want we want everyone to feel free to speak up. We we don't want we don't want you to expect us to this for this to be a presentation. Uh, there's Athena. Wouldn't you know it? My internet just dropped. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have turned on my phone hotspot. So. <laughs> <laughs> see how this goes <laughs> yay you're back i'm um, back take it away trey just in I, case i was just telling them uh that uh you know we wanted this to be participatory and for them to feel free to speak up that this is not really going to be a presentation we really want it to be a roundtable discussion as much as that is possible in an online environment So I guess I would wonder what you were hoping to hear when you came today. Um, we can launch into some of the things we looked at in advance, but what did you want to talk about or hear people talk about? Hi, can you hear me? I can. Yes. This is Liz Seiler. I'm at UNC Charlotte. Um, I, like you all said, have thought about this a lot. In fact, we recently had conversations in our unit about um, how to promote our value to just our library community, not even just outside of the library. Um, and so I guess I just wanted to hear how other people were being, were, how they had maybe been successful in being able to um, um, promote their value. But, um, you know, that, that's why uh, I'm here. Um, I know that we've, I've done work related to promoting the value of our resources, um, which is, uh, you know, through blogs and other um, outlets, but in terms of promoting the value of the work that's actually being done, um, I was interested in that conversation. Yeah, I think yeah. everybody That is a of, really interesting distinction. Mm -hmm. A lot of people definitely understand the value of the resources we provide, but not the work we do. Yeah, very much. Very good. Feel free to pipe up guys and gals and people, all peoples. Hi, this is Michelle Knapp. I'm at the University of San Diego Law Library. And I moved from our reference team to head of collection services a little over two years ago. So we did a reorganization, but now the university is looking to 
buy some people out to save money during this time. And so I am likely to be taking on some additional people to supervise. And so we're lucky to have as many people working in traditional technical services roles as we are right now. But of course, I'm definitely concerned that downsizing given budgets and all of that is going to be a part of our future. So I'm also looking to communicate the value of our work and also looking to try to communicate each individual's value and my own value as we're moving into a time where I'm likely to double the number of people that I supervise in technical uh. services and we're at a time when, you know, a raise, a promotion is Hello. not likely. <laughs> Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Victoria Hi. Rodriguez, and I'm the health sciences uh, systems librarian at Orlando Health. And so um, going back to, I think, two commenters ago, uh, it kind of made me think about how I'm the only one who reports stats about what the library does that aren't really about what I do. So right. I present usage stats and all kinds of things about how our collections are being used while our reference librarian has her interactions and um, our consumer health librarian has her interactions and I have the hardest time really reflecting what I do. Yeah, I think that's a really, really common challenge and I I am in e-resources so I like you would think I can report counter stats I can report how much we spend I can report how many things we licensed or those sorts of things some sort of quantification but I think uh, are there any catalogers here I'm very curious um, what they report because uh, I cataloged X many items doesn't really sparkle to someone who doesn't understand what's involved. Hello, this is Rachel Erb. I'm at um, Florida Academic Library Services Cooperative. Hey, I think Rachel. we'll now be FVL FVLC. Um, and I, it's been a long time since I cataloged, but I did work closely with catalogers in a past life. And I felt that a way they can immediately communicate their value in the work that they do with, I'm thinking of other um, constituents within the libraries, has to do with DDA bib records, I would say hands down, um, because of the issues with those records. And then as we migrated to uh, Discovery uh, Primo in particular, <clears throat> there was a lot of work that had to be involved with that as well. So I think that was something really finite that people understood and appreciated. I think it's been harder for catalogers since uh, a lot of e-resource work and cataloging, depending on your institution, may or may not be done in cats, the cataloging department or unit. And that work has shifted uh, even with maintaining uh, e-resource holdings, you know, that's all done in the in the resources units and often automatically pumped into your catalog through a record load, right? So um, even though it's cataloging work, it, who's doing that work might have changed over time, but that's a very good point, Rachel, the complexities of e-resource cataloging. So I'm uh, Robert Eaton at Utah State. I think it's interesting. Well, it's interesting. I have light behind me, so you can't see me, sorry. Um, just that the things that take the most effort aren't necessarily the most important things. And also the things that we can quantify and put a number on aren't necessarily the things that have the most value. I think uh, I was talking to a friend in another area that um, did a workshop that people keep talking about. And she's like, well, I only spent, you know, half a day on that. That wasn't a lot of work, but it had a lot of impact. And so I think that's one of the challenges is getting away from, I loaded 1200 mark records instead of saying, you know what, I took, I took a thoughtful approach to how we made this little change to how we set up discovery to how we whatever. Um, and it turns out that actually has more impact, but finding some way to talk about it that people can relate to and that has some sort of quantifiable weight to it, I think is a challenge. 
I can totally relate to that kind of thing. I'm not in cataloging, but I, I do understand. I run into um, people being impressed by what I consider some of the more trivial things that I have done. Uh, and they get super impressed by it, but it wasn't the thing that was really hard or actually affects the experience of our collection the most. So it's interesting how those can misalign. In the chat, uh, Laura Sill posted, how have units within technical services in your libraries pulled together to present a shared value statement, especially when there are several units or programs involved? I wonder if we miss opportunities to present a wonderful story because we are only sharing the story from a specific functional perspective. Um, that's something I can say, at least at UF, that um, we're sort of working on both as a library. Uh, we um, just initiated uh, an effort to develop a library-wide value statement. And so um, definitely something we're going to have to think about in tech services um, in general and acquisitions and collection services, my department. Uh, I think, interestingly, one of my colleagues, uh, Aaron Gallagher, uh, who's also a director of the Charleston Conference, um, it recently worked on a, a book chapter um, entitled Guiding Principles for Technical Services Through a Content Analysis of Strategic Plans. It's uh, not yet published. It's going to be in the Advances in Library Administration Organization, Technical Services in the 21st Century. Um, uh, coming out this year, we hope. Uh, but they developed five guiding principles. Um, so the, the principles are that collect service tech services can't be decoupled from collections. Uh, technical services is committed to the user experience. Technical services work can't be accomplished in a silo. Technical service staffing and services need to be continually assessed. And technical service professionals, and I think this is the most interesting one, advocate for and brand their work. And I think that's the one, at least in my, personally, I think we're the worst at is advocating and branding our own work. Uh, yeah, I can put that in the chat. Let's see here. It's- <laughs> I, this, I'll share the screen um, with it. Yeah, this uh, citation might be a little wonky. I was doing it pretty late at night last night. So apologies if it doesn't conform exactly to uh, a known standard. <laughs> so yeah. The, so one of the things in, uh, well, I think there was another chat. Jordan Hale says, going to shout out the work of the information maintainers community, foregrounding all the different kinds of maintenance work and all kinds of organizations. Information maintainers, I like that term. I've not heard that before, but it's appropriate. Yeah, that, that is good. I think trying to come up with a holistic or unified presentation of the value of the library is ultimately the goal um, because Without, with collections just sitting there, obviously that's not, that's preserving, but nothing else. And um, they have to be organized. They have to be available for use. They have to be discoverable and our users need to be taught and helped with interacting with them. So trying to pull all that together to show the impact and the value of the library to the institution, I think is what we all would like. Um, one of the things I've thought about is how do we develop the connections between those different activities and data sets. So uh, library instructions at UCF anyway has started having the users sign in to uh, the instruction session via our institutional sign in page. So there's a record that says it was this specific student attending this specific instruction and there may be certainly our privacy questions around the more we gather data about specific activities of users, 
Um, and then in Open Athens that we just shifted to, they also sign in through that same sort of system and we could tie in, right now we're not gathering that data, but we could then tie in this specific user, use these specific things. And then we could go to institutional knowledge and say they got these grades and we could then say, and we bought it uh, in this year and cataloging, you know, add the records. So all of those pieces could be theoretically all gathered together. I don't know. I don't know if that's the right approach, but I've thought about how would we develop those connections if we wanted to use that approach. So I'm, I'm curious, what do people think? Is that something that sh should be pursued? Is it a bad idea because of the privacy? Um, is it just not going to actually give a good story? I'm going to stop sharing so you can see speakers and chat again. Um, this is Liz again. We have Open Athens as well. And part of the reason we got it was the ability to connect it to user data. But I do think you can um, un you can anonymize that user data. So you're not saying this specific student did this specific thing, but you can say the students from this school are using this resource um, and it's leading to you know, success in that work. So I think you could do it without the privacy issue. But one other thing that we do is um, we have um, a ticket system where if there is an issue with a resource, it comes directly to us. And right now we're working on analyzing that, but we can also show like we answered eight tickets on access issues today and we, you know, help that many users be able to access what they needed to access. So that's another way you could sort of measure the same sort of like interaction that reference has with with users, you could all you have that same interaction in some cases with your users in terms of just, you know, fixing access issues. I think it's kind of interesting. It just occurred to me, or maybe I just connected the dots that a, a lot, if not most of the data that's used in uh, student success studies uh, comes from tech services, ultimately, whether it's circulation data, um, e-resource usage data, oh. et cetera. It's mostly tech service, um, except for maybe instruction stats, whether a student attended an instruction session. That's not um, true at UCF, though. Really? Really. It's mostly from public services right now. So their instruction stats, their reference use stats, their uh, research consultations, things like that. Yeah. So we've not pursued a ton of these studies, but actually you're right. The one study we are is focusing on public service stats, even though I think, well, I have, I have questions and concerns about student success studies in general and whether that's something that we should be focusing on as a profession because we are inherently valuable, but I think that's part of this this discussion today is showing our inherent value. Um, so one of the things we did at UF uh, during the pandemic was uh, we started having these uh, weekly town halls uh, that were all, all library town halls uh, just to communicate information. And they started having these um, one-off you know, sessions uh, where people got to present what they were doing and and sort of by the numbers so a lot of stats and um our department did we showed a number of tickets because there was an increase in e-resource problem tickets so we showed the number of tickets over last year that we had addressed um aaron gallagher and her e-resources unit uh ramonda margioni she's on the call here somewhere uh all of her um units the invoices that her unit processed uh, we went from a almost completely paper-based invoicing system to uh, PDF invoices, invoicing system overnight, essentially, uh, with the start of the pandemic. And so the, the number of invoices uh, processed at the end of the fiscal year last year versus this year, there was a huge sort of this kind of graph going on. I don't know if you can, that makes sense or not, but um, so uh, number of eBooks and streaming videos bought, specifically in response to the pandemic or for course reserves that those sorts of numbers so it was a really good venue to um showcase the work that we that we do, do in our department um have are other schools doing anything like that hi this is nan and i'm at the university of georgia and yeah we've been it's it's really just an in-house thing but we were having 
little in-house conferences before the pandemic. And mm -hmm. it would often start with sort of a parade of statistics just projected on a screen as everybody was coming in. And then people would give lightning talks about projects they'd done. And, and I was surprised and pleased that a number of them were in technical services. And it was, it was really enlightening, some of the projects people had worked on that maybe we wouldn't have heard of otherwise and the, the impact that those projects could have on users. So, so we all enjoyed that, but it was sort of inwardly focused rather than, than outward. Right, yeah. It's so easy to, to navel gaze. We do a lot of that. Um, and it's important work too, right? You have to understand yourself um, and make, because in, if, if your colleagues don't understand and appreciate and value your work, how, how can you get um, your external stakeholders to do that, right? So it's part of the process as well. So it's not Absolutely. just gazing, gazing. I really like that idea of having uh, town halls that are not just within the one department so that you're spreading the word so people can start developing understanding across departments. I can see it turning into um, just sort of mini annual reports without much dialogue or actual development or even attempt to develop understanding, just sort of showing here's these things that we did and uh, it doesn't really explain what is important about them or the work involved. So ha has that been the case at any of yours or how, how have they been tone wise? For us, it worked really, I can see why you'd have that concern, but it actually worked really well because people would, and they had to do it in a really short space of time, talk about why is this important? Why does this matter? What's different now that we did it? And another benefit that it had sometimes was to get people working across different areas and departments. It would spark an idea that would then would lead to another project because everybody, you know, is like, I want to be up there in the spotlight with the cool stuff I'm doing, you know, that sort of thing. So no, it didn't turn into just uh, you know, just wrote reporting at all. In the chat, Eric Frierson says, we have a concept of component ownership in our development teams. This concept reflects all of the underlying work that goes into making any application piece of software work, it includes keeping the software up to date. So changes within the with the company aren't bogged down by abandoned legacy software. The value of this work is clear when put into that context. It's easy for me as a development manager to communicate why we spend the time that we do. Um, there's no end, use, end user impact or outcome assessment, but it's recognized as critical to the health of the organization. Um, wonder if there's something we can use to translate to tech services. And Rachel Erb says, in my past life, one of our library faculty, oh, it just moved. Uh, council chairs sought volunteers for each one of their meeting to present on current projects. It was a nice balance from all units. There's a lot of chat. I don't know. I'm trying to read just for accessibility. You know, people can't see the chat, but there's a lot. Um, should, Athena, should I keep reading or do we want to try to focus on discussion? I think you're muted, Athena. I was indeed. It's, um, I think that uh, it slowed down a little bit, so maybe yeah. we could finish reading these few. Yeah, Laura Silk uh, referencing component ownership is a great way to express it, ensures the focus is on the service and not accomplishments. Agnes um, it says that here at Michigan State, we have a system where librarians have a secondary responsibility and another unit from their primary assignment. Interesting. This helps us have an overall library work culture, helps catalogers be known and do uh, things outside of cataloging. cataloging. Hopefully that has some relationship to the primary work. Our map cataloger, for instance, has, ah, I moved it again, sorry. Uh, map cataloger, secondary and reference where um, he shares the cataloging perspectives on top, you know, with the reference librarians. That's great. So sort of cross training. Yeah. That's one thing that's uh, true at UCF is that a lot of the catalogers and acquisitions folks started in reference. Uh, so we feel like we have that perspective. It hardly ever goes the other way around though. I work a couple hours a week at the, well, now the virtual reference desk and, and ask a librarian, but um, most of the tech services folks don't. So I don't think reference is getting 
as much of the perspective of technical services as the technical services folks already have the perspective of reference. And there was one chat that we skipped, so I'll read it. Okay. It was from M Michelle Brewer. Uh, I call the it's the overall trend towards outcome metrics or ROI return on investment metrics in academia. Like what difference did it make? The higher order values. So tie to success of educational efforts, success of student graduating or an institutional success that the clinician made a difference diagnosis or the therapy choice, um, therapy choice or drug choice in incorporate uh, patents or more revenue, but it is hard to directly tie the activities to such higher order values. I think you can creatively do with other data at institutions and surveys uh, for those outcomes too. I am sorry, Michelle, I know I kind of butchered all of that, but I think people got the trend. I agree, it's very hard to tie to those higher level outcomes. Yeah. Faye O'Reilly says that they also have similar town halls uh, where tech service projects uh, updates come into the play at the end of the year with no fanfare though. Um, but she says it's clear clear to her that uh, they need to self-advocate more. So I'm gonna do a slight pivot here. I'm wondering two things, what tools people use to pull this information together and present it uh, to gather the stats of your work or whatever. And, and are you doing some sort of massaging of it to do visualizations or how is it done? And how do you have the time <laughs> to do it? Because it sounds great, but I'm thinking, okay, if I'm now having to, okay, I can report the number of invoices fairly trivially, but what does that mean? Uh, some of those invoices have 2000 titles and some of them took two weeks to sort out. And some of them have a hundred titles and ran in uh, 30 minutes uh, or it's a single invoice. So what does it mean if I report the number of invoices? Um, and oh I would have to train my staff to do it. So what is your approach? How did you build up this ability or how would you build it up? Don't be shy about turning uh, your microphone on. I, I can say at UF, we have dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of spreadsheets. <laughs> we uh, I'm collection assessment librarian, so that is my job. So um, gathering data and pulling it all together and displaying it. Um, right now, we're mostly using Tableau, but um, public for just our own, actually mostly our own um, um, use. Um, but we'd like to make it more uh, available, like being able to have a app where um, the librarians can look for their um, resource that, or faculty can see the usage of uh, resources. In terms of the financial aspect, it's, um, it is real hard, as you said, a, a single payment, um, you know, is for a science direct or a um, you know a database uh, that's multidisciplinary how do you divide it up how do you um, display it we sort of put that off to the side um, and I would like to focus on impacts um, and but that takes a lot more hard it, it's harder to get that data um, but we have opened up the a relationship with our um, university um, data people uh, so we now have access to a whole ton of data at the student level, and uh, but we're not sure exactly how to use it beyond enrollment. Um, um, I'd like to see some of our subject librarians looking at that at the course level to see where the highest DWI, um, DWFIs um, um, are and maybe work Could with you that. tell us what DWI and DWFI are? I'm sorry, uh, drops, failures, uh, oh, okay. withdrawals, and uh, incompletes um, um, so that the librarians can see where they could possibly help, um, you know, and, you know, 
we had an instance where that happened several years ago um, where um, some of our students in a particular class were having high failure rates, high DFWI rates. And so, but I think it was a faculty member who approached us and I, uh, our subject librarian, and I'd like to see it the other way around. <laughs> so those are the sorts of things. Where in terms of tools, we use mostly um, SQL Server, um, pulling together data through um, um, also Python. I'm fortunate to be able to hire a staff person to do all that and a graduate part time. Taking a moment to read some of the comments. Thank you for those, Karen. Um, from Andrea Wirth. I'm in Skalcom, which is part of tech services at my library, and we report consultations and workshops in the same report uh, public services uses, same system public services uses, which is Lib, Lib Analytics. We have yet to make good use of the data in end of year reporting otherwise. We have Lib Analytics. Um, we're not really using it. We have Lib Insights for tracking reference interactions. And then Eric says, I feel like we have a strong culture of valuing organizational health, and that comes from the top. During all company meetings, we talk about how able we are to grow and change in response to our role, our, our customer environment, and exactly what role the comp component ownership work plays in that ability. So, um, there was something I was going to ask about. Now it has slipped my mind. Let me look at my notes for a moment. Feel free to talk amongst yourself. One thing that we're to, I, I don't want to pivot too much again. Uh, we can always pivot back, but one thing we're thinking about in our unit is uh, exploring social media, uh, having, uh, you know, all of the, our branch libraries have social media accounts. And so we're thinking about doing that in acquisitions. Um, but we're not sure what we want to do with it, how to go about it. Uh, and I was just curious if any tech service units, um, outside of preservation, you know, they get to show off all the fancy books they're fixing, but, uh, and if anyone else has, uh, any social media presence in tech services. We tried Twitter at NC state in our acquisitions department many years ago, and it became one more thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and we were only tweeting amongst ourselves. So, you know, um, that was when Twitter was was uh, new out of the nest, so to speak. Um, and 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 most of us were were scratching our heads as to what exactly the point of Twitter was. Um, so I don't I don't think I'd count us as an example, but it was just, it was just funny. But it became one more thing. You know, you have to send one tweet a day. I was like, really? You know, I'm lucky if I can get to the bathroom sometimes, let alone <laughs> send send out a tweet. So, or maybe I could tweet. I'm going to the loo. <laughs> yeah, um, we've we're definitely struggling with the the one more thing to do aspect of social media. I, I personally am wondering if. I mean, you, you hear, you know, library Twitter, right? Like we're talking amongst ourselves. And if I, I kind of question even the social media accounts that we have that are public facing or intended to engage students, they have very low followings right. um, for social media. Uh, so, and the number of students we have at UF. So I, I wonder if it's not more about talk, the point is to talk amongst ourselves and to talk to other librarians and to demonstrate our value to our own profession. Um, if if that might not be more successful than, uh, and, and you see a lot of librarians doing that on, our, on the personal level. Um, but if we have, I have a staff of 15, 17, if we ever get to hire everyone. So, you know, with 17 people sharing an account that might be less of a commitment than individually. Uh, Susan Ferran says something about social media. We have a cataloger on our social media committee, she photographs some of the amazing things she catalogs and share them and shares them on Facebook and Instagram. 
Uh, she specializes in rare geographical books. And Peggy says, ha ha, I'm glad to know that I'm not the only one <laughs> about drinking water and 50 emails. Okay. <laughs> So I recall what I was going to maybe launch into, and it's a slight pivot, but not a big one. Uh, sort of thinking again about um, if you're doing various sorts of assessments and trying to figure out, for instance, that invoice that I just processed, what subjects did it affect? Because the invoice isn't going to say anything about it. The usage data actually doesn't say anything about it, uh, subject it either. So you've got these two pieces of information, your invoice, which maybe will line easily or difficult, more difficult alignment with your usage statistics from counter. And then they don't really easily align at all with your usage data from either Easy Proxy or Open Athens. And then you've got things like KBART which, and other uh, systems that might tell you other data about what you're purchasing. Uh, some of them might include some subject information. So trying to align all of that so you can start doing assessments is hell a lot of work. So um, I'm very curious and interested in trying to make that work more easily accomplished through maybe standard package IDs or something along those lines. Um, I'm gonna share my screen just briefly. This is from the presentation I watched yesterday. It was really good. I think it was yesterday. It was not just for the sake of from analytics to informed decision making. And uh, there was, um, I think it was from that presentation. And I really apologize for not having a good citation. But they were demonstrating um, a beta of part of what is folio. So you can go and check out the folio presentations and see if you can find the presentation with these slides. These were some screenshots I grabbed while they were talking of their system uh, that was doing some, you input various data and it can output these nifty, wonderful looking dashboards. So to do this sort of thing, I think all of the data needs to have connection points though. And I'm wondering how we make sure those connection points exist. So you can say, I had this many loans and what were the request subject areas? That would be an important thing to know. Or were they things that we are doing document delivery from our collection and what were the, again, what were the subject areas? What was the user set? Um, but anyway, even without all of that additional layered information, this looks pretty cool to me and I wanted to share it. I stop sharing now though, because I don't have a good citation for it. <laughs> My colleague Ramonda reminded me that um, in some ways we have some of that data already uh, with how we structure our budgets based on subject areas or different codings and systems. Um, and we do put out reports that are useful, I think, they're just shy though of having all of the the data and connections that you're talking about to be to re to really show the value and and to be super useful they're they're really great for budgeting purposes right but um yeah there's some other chats here i don't want to lose them uh there was um ann uh said that she works at a community college. Um, they have tickets, but not, but also emails. And uh, it's hard to communicate the value beyond the libraries since they fall in under IT. Um, she wanted to create a video of what we do, um, but didn't get buy-in. And Jacqueline um, said that she had seen some success with the behind the scenes type YouTube videos or Instagram stories for raising awareness. Um, Jessica said, I would love if counter reports included call numbers for books and journals that would allow us to category, categorize somewhat by subject area. Um, <laughs> Jennifer says she's glad she's not the only one who grabbed those screenshots, Athena. She's also working on an ER dashboard. Um, yeah, Karen's talking about usage and counter reports and how they're um, they're, they're not inventory management. Uh, they need MARC records and KBART reports that the usage can be matched to. 
uh, would you, um, Arnold, I'm pr probably not pronouncing your name correctly, I apologize, uh, wants to know if we would welcome vendors offering support when it comes to internal promotion and or new, exist new and or existing resources at the library. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Faye, in response to Anne, says um, some people prefer emails over ticketing systems, and it's another step to track those emails. Uh, Jessica plus one's Karen's comments, um, and Karen also mentions the folio presentations, um, but she doubts her POW would consider changing. I don't know what a POW is in this context, but anyways. Oh, place of work, right? Not that makes more work. sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, though we kind of feel like that some days. I'm, sure. I'm sorry. I'm I'm a acronym kind of person. Um, regarding trying to divvy up uh, or trying to um, demonstrate um, usage, money spent, and that sort of thing by uh, subject area, we've been we've implemented a collection mapping system based largely on call number. And um, for, the long, for a long time, we knew that we were missing a whole ton of stuff because um, uh, our, especially electronics uh, didn't all resource, and especially our AV, physical or electronic, um, because, especially physical, because our AV is stored in a um, 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 closed shelf um, uh, system, and so they don't, aren't assigned call numbers um, at all. Uh, well, like call numbers are uh, um, uh, accession numbers, um, yeah, not okay. uh, subject oriented. Um, and, um, and then uh, a very smart cataloger um, uh, helped uh, put together a way of capturing a good chunk from OCLC of call numbers. So we've been able to add a whole ton of uh, stuff, but yeah, it's not easy when uh, the mark records that you get from uh, bulk downloads uh, don't provide those. Uh, I don't think any of our early English books online have any. So we have a ton of, uh, of e-resources that you know don't have call numbers. So that's a big problem for us. So I'm curious if anyone has uh, aligned their fund codes or their call numbers with CIP codes, um, which is what most institutions in the U.S. use to categorize their their uh, degree programs or their courses, and then that's usually used for reporting out enrollments to uh, various organizations. So if you wanted to tie in a particular fund code or subject classification and show it it's supporting these um, these programs has anyone attempted that I know we have done that some here in a, our Florida consortia but I'm gonna stop talking and let other people report that. <clears throat> Uh, several years ago, uh, the University of Florida went to a RCM budget model across the campus, Responsibility Center Management, I think. And we didn't tie them to CIP codes, but we did tie all of our resources loosely to a college um, on campus. Uh, and that was hard. I mean, if you look at an Elsevier package, how are you going to split that up and, and value titles across different disciplines? And so we, we sort of artificially just divided it or multi B resources uh, divided them evenly, but um, it was very Ow. imprecise. Ow. So nothing close to CIP codes. Most of what I call the collection map um, is based on um, collections that are traditionally tied to our uh, degree programs. So we have a speech pathology and audiology collection because we have a speech pathology and audiology program. So not specifically CIP codes, but um, the degree programs. Um, some of them are very narrow, like aviation logistics. We have a very narrow collection. What we've done that's very different is from a lot of places is 
we assign subject ranges from the conspectus. Um, so what, um, yeah, OCLC, because we used to subscribe to WorldShare um, collection evaluation system. So we essentially, I essentially took that conspectus and assigned at the subject level, subjects to the most appropriate disciplines. The thing is, right, we allow overlap. So we focus on the interdisciplinarity of our programs. So social science research, H68 or something like that, um, is assigned to many, many, many collections because we have many social science programs that use that. Um, and, um, and of course, we can't do the kind of summing um, because the sum is more than the parts, uh, the, um, but we can, of the total that's overlapping, overlapping everything, we can put a percentage, um, but we make it clear that this is overlapped. Um, but we don't really do that with money right now anyhow, because we still can't get to the dividing up a big invoice, a single invoice for science direct package um, by title, unless we use the, pri the um, list price and that's not really what we spent. So <laughs> it's, um, it is hard, but that it, that's I think something different than a lot of places do. Um, yeah, that brings up, uh, your last uh, sentence brings up uh, something I think everyone in acquisition struggles with is, okay, how do I assess these access only titles? We've gone to a database model and the line item invoice price for these 2000 journals that I'm getting, the line item price is zero. So how do I tell that story? How do I do a cost per use per journal? I have to sort of make up a list price or do uh, some sort of approximation. And it's a lot of work to try and, and get the list prices that they don't ever present them in a way that's a, here's the spreadsheet of exactly what you need with the connector you need to pull these two spreadsheets together in a sensible way. Has, speaking of um, looking at cost, has anyone attempted um, uh, cost avoidance reports, especially now that a lot of us are doing negotiations with our publishers and vendors to reduce or keep flat our costs or uh, looked at cost savings to faculty for read and publish deals or APC discounts? A lot of that negotiation does happen in tech services, though some of it may happen at higher levels at your institution. It's something I'm struggling with right now, for sure. I know that uh, FALSI or FLVC before them occasionally did cost avoidance reports, but we haven't done them locally. Uh, I think it maybe is a little, um, I shouldn't say easier, but I'm going to say easier for consortia to do it because they you know, negotiated down a price for the entire state system and uh, they can say this is what the offer would have been without us right but yeah, yeah. it's easier for multi-year deals because uh, you know you can get, at least guess easily what the cost increase would have been uh, where for some of our smaller subscriptions you know we maybe we plan on a six percent increase uh, and got zero so but was six percent really what the increase would have been it's hard to know right we started collecting cost avoidance. Um, we started collecting list price in 2019. Um, and we do that for our state funded collection along with the opt-ins. Um, and now that we've launched Consortium Manager, which manages consortial acquisitions, it has a cost avoidance report module. So you can, when you log in, you can run those reports on demand. One of the things I struggle with is that I, I when I ask for list price and I see what it is, and sometimes I think, hmm, that's a bit inflated. Do you question it? Do you just take it and go with it? That's something I've always struggled with. My opinion is that the cost of all of the resources that we pay for are high, the cost is highly subjective and I don't, I don't really believe list price. 
Um, I, and I don't know that this, it has a good answer, right? I think you're right, Rachel. Um, just to catch up on the chat a little bit, uh, Jennifer uh, suggests that a sort of a day in the life of a cataloger uh, type deals uh, are successful in showing other departments what they do. Um, Veronica um, references customer service and, and demonstrating value to, uh, from the customer service end. Athena uh, put some information about CIP codes. Uh, Stephanie uh, talks about uh, administering uh, e-resources and all the different systems that are needed. Um, and asks, have libraries gone the way of a single company to supply many as many of the connected system as possible so it's easier to match up data? Um, I mean, the state of Florida, all public uh, colleges and universities are moving to uh, Alma Primo, um, so in some ways we're headed that way. Um, Faye, in response to Stephanie, says they have a different company for every eRes system, and that's part of the problem. Heavy workload, trying to match the data. Jennifer um, is talking about list price and how they talk about street price. I, I heard that in your presentation the other day from, I think it, if it wasn't you, Jennifer, it was someone else from Ohio Link talking about street price. Um, Jay Weezy says that the list price is like the sticker price for a new car. I think that's true. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of messages. We only have five minutes. I don't think I'm going to be able to get the, through them all. Uh, Athena, do we want to wrap up somehow? I, I think, yeah, let's not just spend the last five minutes yeah, reading, reading. The, yeah. no, there are some <laughs> great comments in there. Uh, yeah, I think if I were to sum up the, the problem with getting list price, I would say if there are any vendors on, if you can help us tell us the story of cost avoidance, that would help. Uh, the confidentiality clauses are not your friend for us being able to show that we're getting a good value. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, and uh, go ahead, Trey. I, I was just gonna say, I, I think I subconsciously knew this going into this uh, roundtable discussion today, but I, what's become apparent is that there's both sort of um, qualitative and quantitative measures that are, are gonna have to be put together for us to tell a complete tech service story. It's it's not just <laughs> hard figures, it's not <clears throat> just the the soft skills of communicating and and providing good customer service it's all of the above i think i think one thing that i've been thinking about a little bit but not very much yet is that we're going to have to switch our thinking as we move to transformative agreements and more open access that we are still doing work around those things and we're still delivering value but how we measure and report it is going to have to be nimble and figure out how to, to do that. Um, and I don't really have a lot of thoughts in that direction yet. I'm curious if other people do. Though that's, again, a new new topic introduced in the last three minutes. <laughs> but I really like the idea. Some of the things that stood out for me uh, from our conversations today, uh, the town halls to share the information, uh, and then just the the commitment to having the information, I think, is something that we may need to work on, me personally and the people who report to me, to make sure that we actually can report how many invoices were there and how many things were on those invoices and that sort of thing for the town halls. Um, we still face huge hurdles with trying to align all the different data sets and we get heaps and heaps of data and how do you make sense of it? And I find myself recreating spreadsheets rather than finding the one that I know I created six months ago, stuff like that. Um, so better organization, better communication. I'm gonna stop talking because I feel like I'm oversimplifying to the point of being useless. I thought that was great, Athena. <laughs> Does anyone have any final thoughts or words of wisdom? Do you have any brilliant examples you want to screen share? <laughs> yeah. Anybody? 
Well, I, I've really enjoyed this today. I thought it was a lot more participatory than I feared it might be um, based on our virtual environment. I, I hope others enjoyed it as well. Got something out of it. And we now have 23 people reporting having coffee <laughs> as opposed to only four with tea and one yeah. juice. Still that one mimosa. Maybe Athena, <laughs> if, if you and I could, we can um, capture the chat and uh, work up our document with all of the ideas that were submitted today and our own thoughts to post to the files um, for this session. Uh, that sounds wonderful, Trey. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sounds like work. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> okay. We Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, everybody.